Then, so yes, that's the that's the basically the things that we outlined that our solution should uh, should comply with. Uh, that basically, uh, you see that, for example, include full set of file system operations. Those operations are not even supported in object storage. You cannot rename an object. That's that's practically copying an object. You cannot lock an object. This is not a functionality. This that is native to object storage, and these are functionalities that a lot of applications require. They just would not work with. So, so Alex, is it, a, is it a tiering solution or a caching solution? It's a or? tiering solution. It's a tiering solution, so the data resides either on cloud or on file. Or both, or, but yes, I agree. And, and that, that was the, the solution, so that was the, after doing the analysis, we came to the conclusion that the only way to <coughs> store, uh, solve this problem was to practically create a software only HSM system that sits into your file system and allows you to tier to object storage. That that's basically And so and so the, the surveillance cameras are feeding the, the on the on local file system and then over time though that yeah, data would be based on policies. migrated or moved to exactly. Uh, cloud. Exactly. And this this is made in a situ in a situ way that it's uh, that the file system still needs to be there. That's why that's the difference between the virtual and the real file system because the real file system still provides the applications with all the functionality that the application so may do require. Do you install an agent on each single node that has yes. this file system? Yes, or, obviously you. So the file system is not yours, it's the local file system on the on the on the machine. Yes, that's that's why the mandate being Windows, that's one of the good things about Windows that there is one file system. Okay, uh, REFS is uh, still not there. Okay, so you, you support uh, Windows. Only. That was originally the okay. uh, that was originally the mandate, and we actually focused on Windows because practically, practically yes, of course uh, uh, we because our SAN solutions are multi-platform, so we have solutions for Mac, Windows, uh, and Linux. Uh, but uh, having you to dig uh, uh, to install yourself into the kernel and into the file system actually. Uh, on Linux platform is becoming a lot more difficult task than normally because from people's perspective, Linux is one operating system. But that actually is true only when you're talking to the applications. When you go into the kernel level, every Linux kernel is different. Every Linux distribution is different. You cannot build a kernel driver for Linux. That, that is, you know, CentOS is one thing, Ubuntu is another thing, is a completely different. And, uh, and so we actually, not, not, not only because that was the kind of the, the original task, but we made the analysis that uh, such a solution would be very, uh, very good for things like file servers. And we said, okay, you know, the world when it comes to file servers or application servers is still probably 50-50 between Windows and Linux. And the effort for us to having our expertise to address the Windows side would be much better and much, we can address it a lot more efficiently. So we are we have a we're working actually of having a Linux version, but as it stands today, we still are offering our Windows version. Yeah. Everything we're leading up to here is called Tiger Bridge. Yes. Okay. So, so getting back to our original problem, so we actually, and I want to talk a little bit technical here, is yes, of course, we ended up of the conclusions that they just mentioned about how this solution should function, but we actually had to make a lot of. Uh, uh, pure engineering and technical decisions uh, in order to make these solutions. And I want to just talk a little bit about them because they lead us to where we are today and some of the unique offerings that we bring to the market. Obviously, the, you know, here I have listed some of those. So we have to first think about file versus block. What that means is that there are a lot of solutions out there that actually take the data in blocks as it is in on-prem. For example, you can have uh, clusters within your file system or something, and they move it they move it to elsewhere. Let's say, in this case, to object storage to the cloud. The problem with this approach is, uh, which is something that we couldn't afford, is that this leads to, this leads to what is called vendor lock. Because technically, you're getting a piece of data, which is not a file, which, which is only uh, let's say, meaningful within the context of the original file system, and you, you move it to an object. So this object becomes practically useless and the target without, without the source. So, and that actually is still the case with a, lot of, uh, with a lot of the solutions out there, and that's been one of the biggest uh, uh, factors for people being hesitant towards adopting the cloud. 
you know, the vendor lock is basically nobody wants to uh, have their data in such a fashion that if they remove the solution they're using, the data would be useless. We, we have taken the decision that we need to maintain a one-to-one -one relation between a file in the file system and an object in the in the in the cloud or in any object storage, and and that this object has to be named exactly the same way. So when you go into your object storage environment, be it Azure, AWS, IBM, Google, etc., you see your file system, and if you remove our software, data is there. How do you maintain the hierarchy, the directory, the, all the metadata associated with the files and all that stuff? It's a challenge, uh, to be honest, because m mainly because of the functionality that is missing in the cloud. And yes, uh, for example, the, the biggest problem is the rename operation. <coughs> there is no rename. So if obviously, in the file system, you can rema rename as much as you like. In the, op uh, in the cloud, uh, rename is a problem. Uh, rename is a copy of the object. So, so what we do is we uh, we maintain the renames of files, but we actually maintain a metadata structure uh, metadata structure in the cloud, which allows you to keep some of the metadata for objects on prem that are not available in the cloud. For example, uh, security descriptor. There is no concept of security descriptor in an object storage. There is no <coughs> place to store such an information. So we actually maintain a metadata object associated to the data object that that has all the uh, characteristics or all the data that is associated with, with the original data on-prem. And there we also store the original file name. So even if something goes wrong and the link is broken, and actually we intentionally do not rename folders in the cloud because, for example, if you go into a local file system and you rename a folder that happens to contain tens of thousands of folders and millions of files. If you want to maintain the exact link with the cloud, that would result into a million of opera a copy operations, which, by the way, are expensive on top of that. Uh, so, so yes, we are not doing that. We are just changing the metadata. So the data there actually would appear as originally uploaded when it comes to folders, only for files we rename it. But if you have to need to retrieve the data back, even in the case of total data loss of your file system, it will be retrieved in the proper so way. You because keep a method. central database. Mm -hmm. You keep a central <laughs> database of all the metadata. No, uh, central. No, we don't keep a database. We, we. This is one of the things you can see there is that we have been very, very. Uh, insistent of not using a database. Because database is something that gets corrupted, you need to protect, etc., etc. In both places, both on-prem and in the cloud, you have a kind of database in the form of your file system. In, in, in the, in the on-prem, the file system is your database. It maintains all the hierarchical link, etc. Yes, of course, it's not optimal for searching, which is what databases are good at. But, but we wanted to use the file system. So any information that we associate with an object, uh, file in the file system, we attach it to the file rather than store it in an external database. How do you guys differentiate with things like Microsoft Avia or even like you know the recent one, LucidLink? You know. Yeah. Well. As well as well, publicity we've okay. seen, right? LucidLink just so uh, LucidLink is a virtual file system. Right. They 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 are not file system, which means that by definition it would not al uh, it would not allow you to do what like I said we originally wanted to do, which means 100% compatibility with the file system. There are literally operations that applications may use from NTFS file system that are not available there. That they would just fail. And actually, the biggest thing, uh, the biggest thing that is um, that we, we, we mandate ourselves originally to make sure to make a solution that fits file servers, which means that you can go to your corporate file server, put it there, and it would work completely automated. The most important functionality of a file server is being able to share data over SMB, NFS, whatever, and being able to enforce permissions. Mm -hmm. None of these two things are capable of uh, Lucid Link, Google Drive, OneDrive. I mean, all these. Microsoft Avir? Microsoft Avir is a solution, but this is not aimed to, to actually, Microsoft Avir is not a solution that you put in your file server to bring the data. It's a, they actually, when they acquired Avir, it was uh, Avir was a company that was actually it was in media space. It was doing distrib distributed workflows, mm -hmm. so it's basically a solution to uh, help you uh, transfer data between processing nodes here and here. It's not exactly an object storage gateway. What these things are known. So, but uh, in all this description, I missed something. I mean, 
Sure. So you are, you're talking about a collaborative environment, I mean a shared file system, okay. So yeah. if I have an hundred, a hundred uh, Windows machines that they all share the same file system, mm -hmm. okay, but you're talking about the local file system and then uh, can and I, then an agent that uh, you know uh, can makes all the changes. So how do you maintain consistency between all these nodes if you don't have a central point of? Okay, first of all, uh, let me just draw it quickly if you allow me. So basically, under normal environment, when you go into a corporate network, the typical case is that you have a, a network. These are your m machines, and you have, let's say, a file server with your storage. That's a typical shared storage environment with network. <coughs> so we, that's why I said our original goal was to make sure that, that we can deploy here. So basically right now, if this is Windows, and of course, like I said, there are 50% of the cases in the world is Windows, the others are Linux, but especially in the <clears throat> typical enterprise corporations where things like Active Directory is very important, they are Windows. So we install here, and we actually maintain the link between this file system and here the cloud. So for this guy, it's a completely transparent. There is absolutely no difference whatsoever, no agent, nothing. It still access the SMB or NFS share the way he's been accessing uh, yesterday. And just because we're 100% compliant with the NTFS, because we are part of the, the file system, it's, we actually are, uh, we're actually for this guy, he sees all the security, he sees all the operations, he can do uh, opportunistic logs, range locking, everything that the file system supports that is not supported in the file. So, so, you yes, do you, do you so you try to be like as close as NTFS as possible, right? But putting we it are that's part. Of, we are, uh, and that's part of the, the the things is that we. Uh, one of the things is how to implement that, and we are what is known in Windows environment as a filter driver, which is yet another reason to be on Windows rather than Linux. In Linux, there is no such equivalent. In Linux, if you have to build that solution, you need to build a file system. Well, something that represents as a file system with an operating system. In Windows. <laughs> Just actually, this is a concept which was created uh, back in the days, primarily driven from the antivirus things. And if, if there is anything good about having viruses out there, that's one of these things. Is that in order to create an efficient antivirus application, uh, rather than an external one which tracks your system, it needs to be a filter. And that's every antivirus system today, that's exactly what it is. We are like this, which is called a filter driver, which means that we sit into the path of the the path of the of the, the the data requests right the requests and we can decide whether we can we need to pull these requests for example if the file is not here but there we need to pull it and it's completely transparent so what's a typical ratio between so you said there is a 15 petabyte requirement for this one environment yeah what's the ratio between cloud storage and server storage in the environment is it like 10 to 1 or something like that or <clears throat> well actually this the, this extension uh, solution which allows you to use the to, to use the cloud as an extension of the server is just picking up. I mean, in some environments, let's say in surveillance, absolutely, the more the better. They would like to store as much as they as much as they can in the cloud with as little as they can get away with uh, with local storage. So yes, ten to one is uh, actually even sometimes it's less than ten to one. But actually today. Uh, the more interesting problem uh, that people are trying to solve with the cloud is <coughs> things like disaster recovery. Say, uh, and, and in this case, they're not interested of extending their storage with the cloud. They're interested of having the data elsewhere in a transparent fashion, because if they lose their file server, they need to be able to quickly get the data and the, okay, sure. Oh, sorry, on that line, yeah? application crash consistency or crash consistency, which do you focus on? Your solution app, app application crash consistency okay. or crash consistency? Which do you focus on? Because the RPO and RTO are different, mm -hmm. and you know having awareness of the application and the whole equal stack versus just a filter driver in Windows is a different proposition. Absolutely, correct? and one of the things is that we wanted to make a solution. We we made a solution that is not is application agnostic, which means that we're not trying to make a solution that that would. Uh, address the crash uh, 
potential state, particular yeah, application, yeah. Yeah. But, but your file system. So it's basically like a backup application, the only uh, slightly different than a typical backup application, but a lot of people are backing up their data to, let's say, tape, it used to be backup. So just in case they lose <coughs> storage or something, they can recover from tape. Now today, managing tapes is becoming mm, a lot more difficult <laughs> and uh, uh, it, it cannot be justified easily today with the cloud and especially with some of the cloud tiers that are the lower cloud tiers like uh, Deep Glacier from uh, Amazon, one dollar per terabyte per month. That actually is a tape price without the tape complexity. So people want to use the cloud because it's offsite, managed by somebody else for disaster recovery. And, and this is more the, the more immediate use case that we're seeing more and more. So in that environment, you're replicating the file system data to the cloud in the format that you can access it, uh, non-vendor lock-in kind of format and such like that? Yes. Yeah. And, and that replication occurs only when the file is closed? Yes. So you're not, you're not, you're not providing a, a real-time sort of synchronous replication. You're providing sort of a a sophisticated asynchronous replication that does this when a file is not active yes. in any application, then you move the data over to the cloud. You can say that. Being a filter driver allows us actually to also do a live replication, but we, for now, we, we are not trying to go this route because what we found is that uh, people at this point of time, they're not interested of you messing up with the data flow, for example. So to back to what Tom says, it's really a, it's an application consistent file version of the data. So the, the application closes the file, then it's actually replicated at that point, so it's application consistent, so it rather than crash consistent. It acknowledges yeah. it's not closed. And, right, and the, yes. The, yeah. the data is if it's not closed, it's never replicated. Yeah, so that's, right? that's a Absolutely. challenge. Absolutely, that's why it's not good for database live replication. Right. So there, there, there are cases that it's not good at, but, but at the same time, it is not like, most of the solutions that out there today address this problem, they are made by external external, uh, let's say, whether it's VM or a, something that actually monitors your application. Ours being internal to the file system allows you much better control and much better understanding when something is changed.